up, everyone, and welcome back to the cafe. You've tuned into episode six of the Nichibei Cafe, a mixed plate of Japanese American news and culture. My name is Ryan Yamamoto, and I will be your co host for today's program. And my name is Kelly Okoi, and I am your other co host. This monthly live stream program is brought to you by the Nichibei Foundation and Nichibei Weekly through the benevolence of the Henry and Tomoya Takahashi Charitable Foundation. Today, we are all about summer festivals. We will discuss the significance of Obon, recap summer festivals that have just passed, as well as preview ones that are yet to come. There will also be a sneak peek of our summer book review. We want the Nichibei Cafe to be a place where we can all gather together and share stories of community and culture with you, right in your living space. Since many people are unable to go out and enjoy themselves, we hope to gather here in our virtual cafe. We have met some amazing people and heard some great stories to warm our bellies. If you enjoy what we're doing here at the cafe, please be sure to leave a like on this video and hit that subscribe button for more content just like this. Also, feel free to leave us a comment if you have any suggestions for future episodes or just want to say hi. So, without further delay, let's start the cafe! For our appetizer tonight, we want to offer a preview of our annual summer book review. For more than two decades, a Nichibe publication has published book review sections, whether in its summer book review or its winter book review in the New Year's edition. This was done to shed light on stories by or about Japanese America and Asian America, and to empower authors who may not get such reviews in other publications. Since the passing of Wayne Maeda in 2013, retired California State University Fullerton history professor Art Hansen, the director emeritus of CSU Fullerton's Japanese American Oral History Project, has reviewed most of the works on Japanese American history. Today we will talk about a new book that Professor Hansen actually edited, Beyond the Betrayal, the Memoir of a World War II Japanese American Draft Resister of Conscience, written by Yoshiro or Yosh Kuromiya. The book will be featured in the coming summer book review. His recent works represent the voices of resistance that had for a long time been suppressed by chroniclers of Japanese America. We're proud to give them a platform today. So check out this interview with Frank Abe and Art Hansen on the book Beyond the Betrayal and more. Thank you, Kelly and Ryan. Uh, you know, every July, the Nietzsche Bay Weekly honors writers on topics that pertain to the Japanese American community with publication of the Summer Book Review issue. Uh, I'm here now with one of the most prolific contributors of book reviews to the Nietzsche Bay, um, none other than Professor Emeritus Art Hansen, speaking to us, I believe, from Yorba Linda, California. Why do you feel it's so important to be writing these uh, book reviews for the Nietzsche Bay? I see your name in every issue uh, contributing book reviews. Why so important? Well, I need to stay active. I, I've been working on books, and I think a, a good thing for me to do is to be familiar with the new literature. And Kenji kindly asked me to sort of fill in as one of the lead reviewers a number of years ago, and I've just stayed with it since that time, and I've appreciated it. Well, it's really wonderful. I see your byline. I know it's an article I have to read in the in the book review section. Uh, for those who are meeting Art here for the first time, uh, he's a professor emeritus from Cal State Fullerton, founder of the incredibly valuable resource that is the oral history program at Fullerton. And lately, Art, you've been a machine churning out books on camp resistance, uh, barbed voices and oral history of uh, there it is, barbed voices. An oral history uh, resistance in the World War II Japanese American social disaster, um, Nisei Naysayer, the uh, memoirs of our friend journalist James Omura from Stanford University Press, and now, just now, it is Beyond the Betrayal, the uh, memoirs of Yosh Kuramiya, uh, the first and very likely only book length manuscript from one of the 63 draft resistors from the Heart Mountain Fair Play Committee. You know, Art, after editing this volume of Yosh Kuromiya's memoirs, what's your quick takeaway from it? Well, I think it's an invaluable sort of piece of work because the person that's written it is a fine writer and, and a profound thinker. And uh, I think, uh, you know, it, it's something that is not going to be a, a labor of pain for people to read. I think they can easily uh, assimilate what he's trying to say and, and 
and relate to him. And, and so I think it'll and, and relate to him not only as a writer, but as an example of somebody who had the courage and, and the, uh, the sense of the Constitution and the sense of civil liberties and everything to speak up. Uh, and especially at this juncture in our history when that is a real problem in this country. But when they tried to draft us out of the camps, that's where I drew the line because I shouldn't have to prove my loyalty. They took away my citizenship rights, you know, the government and the people, the public. Absolutely. I mean, Joyce Kremio was always the most, uh, as you know, the most thoughtful and concise uh, speakers and writers on the Fair Play Committee. And it really comes through in his manuscript that you edited. You know, it's most compelling, I think, when Joyce shares his personal feelings about speaking up uh, at the mess hall meetings of the Fair Play Committee uh, and enduring jail time with men he didn't really know uh, and then going to trial in what he calls the circus of the, of the mass trial. Um, but, you know, one of the things that he focuses on is the emotional price he pays uh, for after his sentencing when he's dumped by his girlfriend from camp. Uh, was that something that you, you, you know, I, I think that as I recall in the manuscript phase, he, he was kind of skirting that issue, and I think you and I encouraged him to focus more on that. Uh, no, I don't think he wanted to focus too much on it, but he did come back to it in the book to talk about a later time in his life where he ran into this woman who he had not seen since uh, the, well, the time he left camp. And shortly after, he received the, the Dear Yosh letter, and uh, so, but he ran into her and they, they had a wonderful sort of, you know, embrace and, and, and being able to put everything into proper perspective because she was under the pressure of her family and, and the entire community at Hard Mountain, really. And so he, he understood that, although at the time, of course, it really broke his heart. Yeah, getting that Dear John letter, as he put it, in the uh, Cheyenne County Jail. Um... So I was really glad that he could share that. You know, his, his, Yosha's memoir, it has a lot more of that personal uh, feeling uh, uh, of his, his personal experience. And as I write in my review of the book, you know, I think that's where Yosha's memoir is strongest. And, uh, but, you know, being so insightful, Yosha's also opinionated. And, and this is where I thought your editing of the manuscript art really uh, was so helpful because in your uh, end notes, you really um, interrogate Yosha's occasional hyperbole or misstatement. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that, you know, going through the manuscript and coming across places where, for example, he uh, cites these authors, these conspiracy theories about FDR knowingly allowing the attack on Pearl Harbor as a means of drawing the U.S. into war. Uh, you, you, you add two pages of footnotes on that. Yeah, well, uh... What I was doing when I was editing this was actually creating some firewalls because I don't think the book would have been accepted for publication uh, unless I did this. And fortunately, I had a copy of the anonymous review that was done by Eric Muller. And because Eric Muller is a professor of law and everything and had written a wonderful book, you know, uh, about the whole resistor movement, uh, free to die for the country, uh, uh, I was able to hitchhike off of his information and everything else and put these footnotes in there. Uh, the other one I did pretty much on my own, the long, the long footnote. So what I did was that I looked up as many book reviews as possible for this review. And there were enough differences that Yosa's opinion wasn't so outlandish. There were a lot of people who agreed with his assessment. There were more people who disagreed with it, but I wanted to showcase that so that people could see that this was a disputable thing. And then the way I ended it was by saying, I can understand why he might have felt jaundiced towards Franklin D. Roosevelt. After all, he could have sacrificed people at Pearl Harbor because he sacrificed 110,000 Japanese Americans by signing Executive Order 9066 that consigned them the camp for three years or more. That's absolutely right. It was uh, Robert Stinnett or Stinnett, yeah, Day yeah. of Deceit. Yeah, yeah. So that was, a, I thought, a really nice uh, 
you know, you, you very gently kind of corrected the record there for the readers. Uh, and also with the, the Eric Muller material, I thought that was incredibly valuable where, where Josh would say, well, the Fair Play Steering Committee uh, failed us in not appealing our convictions. And then, uh, you know, I think, tell me about how, how you, you had the Eric Muller, you called it the Muller Critique in the, in yeah. the end notes. But uh, by the time I got it, uh, the, the, the family edition had already been printed and one of the constraints that I had operated on, we would not change anything in that manuscript. Uh -huh. So the end notes was where I really had a chance to, you know, to, to get some, uh, you know, uh, uh, my yeah, yeah. hand into it and stuff, and <laughs> my, my mind into it. But uh, yeah, so, but yeah, I, I was, in fact, I, you know, more I've, I've read that somebody has got to write, and maybe you're the right person to write a, 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 a you know, a biography of Frank Emmy. Um, I, I, in my review, I, I say that, you know, your end notes and Eric's critique uh, are kind of uh, half the, vol the, vol the value of the book, uh, in addition to Yoshi's memoirs. And just a reading of the end notes all the way through is, is an entertaining and informative uh, read. Uh, so we encourage people to get uh, Beyond the Betrayal by Yoshi Kuramiya. You mentioned Gail and the daughters in closing, uh, that uh, the volume could have become just a family souvenir, uh, self-published souvenir. Uh, so how were you able to get them the, the manuscript from being a self-published thing to uh, a, a published volume that we can now have? Well, Lawson Anata contacted me first, and he uh, said that, uh, you know, uh, this family edition is out, and he'd been helping them with them, and he'd written this short stanza, uh, a po poetic stanza that was being used for the, for the forward and everything. And then he said, could you do something to beef this up? And uh, and I said, well, like, like an introduction or something. And he said, yeah. So I said, I'll do that. And so then I read through the family thing and I, and I said, this is a waste to have this just go to his family and his friends. This is an important document. The, the only one, not only of the resistors at Heart Mountain, but of all the 300 uh, so or so re resistors in all the camps. You know, uh, this needed to be published and everything. So I encouraged them. And of course, the daughters were very much in favor of it. Uh, 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 Yosh's uh, widow, Irene, was not so much in favor of it. She, she said Yosh wanted just the family edition. Yeah. Uh, and Gail and others thought down deep he really did want this. But for gosh sakes, he was a nonagenarian at that point. And he died not too many years after this. So, you know, uh, he, he wasn't going to resubmit it to another academic press. He just wanted the family edition to go forth. But I, you know, and I had, had edited the o Omura memoir. So I'd gone through the territory, for God's sake, for 20 years. You know? <laughs> so, so I, and I was used to writing end notes and doing editing. And, and uh, so, yeah, I just said, I'd be happy. To, I'd be happy to edit it. It didn't take me very much time at all to edit it. I, I think I spent at, at the most about two months on it. It's just because of COVID and everything. The press didn't get it together and wasn't able to publish it, so it got delayed by about a year and a half. But it's been done for quite a while. You know, my part of it was done. Well, and your part is really wonderful art. The um... My last question, you may not be able to answer this, but, you know, these are things that 20 years ago, as recently as 20 years ago, year 2000, I mean, we weren't, we weren't talking about draft resistance and resistance oral histories, and uh, you know, we did them, but they weren't really well known. Why do you think that's changed uh, now in, in the year 2022? We have, uh, you know, all your books, Barb Voices, uh, Nisei Naysayer, and now Beyond the Trail. Um, why are these things coming out now? Well, you know, I'm building on things that, that people like yourself and, and, and Frank Chen and uh, Lawson and, and a whole group of people, Roger Daniels, you know, Eric Muller. I mean, the people, it's been accruing over the years. Uh, I was writing about it and Barb Voices is really a compilation of my articles that, you know, I'd written from 1972 when, or 74 when, when the uh, Manzanar Riot article came out. And all of my articles were on resistance 
of one form or another. So that's an anthology. That, that's not a single volume, standalone, one, one manuscript. It was really the, the, the alleged best ones that I had written over those years. So, and, but, but it had been going on. I mean, you keeping it alive, Frank, with the, you know, with the resistors.com, uh, the, uh, having somebody like, like Kenji, B, uh, the son of a resistor, being a, an editor, a formidable editor, you know, and everything was so helpful. Martha Nakagawa, who stayed with all of this sort of stuff. I mean, you know, everybody was there. The times were, were finally getting around. There were a lot of old time JACLers were dying off in part. You know, really that's true because they were a stumbling block to a lot of this sort of thing. And then of course, the final, final thing was Donald Trump's presidency at that particular moment or anything, you know, and now we're seeing people standing up, even Republicans standing up and, and being as courageous as Yosh was in being able to, 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 to say no to the big lie, you know, and, and, and so, I mean, I think now is a very propitious time to do it, but but it's been it's been incrementally being done. So it's not just a suddenly Art Hansen comes and does this thing. No, I mean, I, I was, you know, riding the wave, really, you know. Well, Art, and it's been a wonderful uh, experience just knowing you over the last four decades. And, and I think you're absolutely right that there's certain timing involved uh, in the last five years. The topic of resistance, I've just felt to become more um, interest and uh, energy around the idea of uh, resistance in, in World War II Japanese American incarceration camps and how it sadly relates to uh, our current political climate today. So thank you, Art. Um, dare I ask uh, what else you have on the horizon? Yes, I have a manuscript that's being been accepted for publication called Manzanar Mosaic. And it's also the University Press of Colorado and that will be out in early 2023. And then I've got a, another thing. I've edited a, uh, a diary of Robert Brown, who was the assistant uh, 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 project director at Manzanar. And, and it's just his 1942 diary, that very first year of the first concentration camp. And I had done that 30 some years ago and uh, his widow wanted to borrow the manuscript from me and then she lost it. And so it was gone and that would have been one of my first publications. She lost it. Fortunately, her daughter came, or, or Rob, Bob Brown's daughter walked into the Manzanar Center and, and introduced herself. And the, the Rangers there knew about this story of mine. And so I got in touch with her and I said, do you by any chance? She said, well, I inherited a number of documents and it looks like I've got the one that, that you and you, Bob, my, my father were working on. So it's his diary and I, I edited the diary and everything. And, and then the final thing that I have in the works is a, a, a book dealing with Japanese Americans in, in Arizona during World War II, because you know there were more Japanese Americans in Arizona than any other place in the United States because of Poston having three camps, Gila having two camps, and then having Loop there. And wonderful. Those will all be wonderful and important contributions, Art. So thank you for that. I mean, you've been contributing and continue to contribute, and we're really in, in your in your debt. So thank, thank you, Art. Uh, my review of Beyond the Trail by Yoshikuro Miya, edited by Art Hansen, is in the Nietzsche Bay's uh, new summer book review issue that will be out a week from today, uh, July 21st. Uh, the issue will also include reviews of, well, four book reviews by Art Hansen, uh, Two Lakes Stockade Diary, Asian American Histories of the U.S., A Rebel's Outcry, Biography of Issei Civil Rights Leader Sei Fuji, and American Survivors, Trans-Pacific Memories of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I'm told the issue will also include reviews of uh, The Perfect Sound by Garrett Hongo, uh, Contemporary Asian American Activism by Diane Fugina, Fugino, and also Japan the Cookbook and Ultimate Bento, and a number of children's books too. So uh, a great summer review book issue coming up. Uh, subscribe today uh, to get issues like this and others in your mailbox. Uh, thank you, Art, Kelly, and Ryan. Uh, back to you. Thanks, Frank. 
Be sure to be on the lookout for our summer book review on July 21st. If you aren't subscribed yet to the Nichi Bay Weekly, what are you waiting for? You can get immediate access to all the articles we publish in our paper, plus more. Subscribe today at nichibei.org slash subscribe. And uh, also subscribe to our YouTube channel while you're at it. For the salad course tonight, we can start feasting on summer festivals. But Obon season is not just all about dancing. We interviewed Reverend Matthew Hamasaki of the Sacramento Buddhist Church, who taught us the origins of Obon and what to expect from their Obon this year, which was just held this past weekend. The history of Obon can be traced back to a couple different things. First being the Buddhist story of uh, Moggallana, who was one of the Buddha's disciples. And there is a, a legend about his ability to see into different realms of existence. And he saw his mother in the realm of the hungry ghosts, which is a, a terrible realm uh, that you're born into after you have a, a selfish life. And uh, it's called the realm of the hungry ghost because they can't eat anything even though they're starving. Uh, their mouths are very small. If any food actually does get close to their lips and it bursts into flames. So this terrible existence and being very distraught about this, being unable to help uh, his mother send any food to her or anything, he went to the Buddha and the Buddha told Moggallana that he should give an offering to the monks who were coming back from a retreat and in doing so would create enough uh, good merit, good karma for his mother to be born into a better place. And so Moggallana did as the Buddha asked. And sure enough, when he looked again, then his mother was no longer suffering. So he was so happy that uh, it said that he continued to do this every year, give the uh, offerings to um, all the monks. And within our tradition, it said that he jumped up and uh, danced with joy. And so I say that because um, this celebration uh, of having like a, a feast can be found in many different cultures uh, throughout Asia. However, Japan is the only one that has dancing that goes along with it. And so this is the combination of the influence of Buddhism as well as Chinese culture um, intermingling with uh, Japanese culture. So uh, in Japan, uh, for a long time, it's believed that the souls of people who have passed away come back on uh, the backs of dragonflies or actually change shape and take uh, the form of dragonflies because during um, this kind of summer autumn time that's when a lot of dragonflies are, are present and so to welcome them also to um, guide them back to uh, where they came from which is where we see uh, the like Toronagashi like the land, floating lantern festival things like that so this belief that the um, souls of the deceased come back during this time, coupled with this Chinese Buddhist influence of uh, ancestor worship, as well as the legend of Mogolana coming together was a great obligation of these two cultures. And then the dancing, supposedly from my research, comes from when a place called uh, Sanuki, which is currently Kagawa Prefecture, was in a terrible drought. And hoping to end it, the governor of that area, uh, who was uh, Sugawara no Michizane, he fasted and he prayed for seven days and seven nights. And it was answered where they had rain and people were so happy that they, they danced. And they danced every year as sort of a ritual, but then also like thanking the gods or the spirits for being able to give them uh, a good harvest. The founder of Jodo Shinju, Shinon, his teacher, Honen, was exiled, and he was originally supposed to go someplace else, but he ended up going to this region, and when he got there, he saw people doing this dance, and instead of being grateful or, or uh, thanking the, the spirits or the gods, he told them that they should be uh, chanting the Nembutsu. And so during in that area, they still do this uh, Nembutsu Odori, or you know, Nembutsu dance, and uh, supposedly this is the origin of uh, Bonodori, or a combination of dancing along with uh, this holiday. So um, all that together is why we now have uh, Obon Odori, uh, although, um, you know, now uh, I think the, 
probably dancing is more emphasized than anything else, but that's where the origin comes from. Since Sacramento is the uh, second oldest temple and San Francisco, as I've heard, is uh, has been doing it over 90 years, we're probably close to, to 90 years. We've been doing uh, Obonodori. My vision or her hope, I suppose, would be it becomes more of a, a community event for the Northern California area, that if we can involve the community, if we can make it something that people are not just coming to, you know, appreciate Buddhism or Japanese culture, but for there to be, you know, a little more of an uh, exchange there, then I think that would be uh, wonderful. It's very important for us as uh, we have deep history in Japanese immigrants, Japanese Americans, and their contributions you know, over 100 years uh, in the area. And so it's important for uh, myself and I'm sure many members of the temple to continue to carry that on through this annual festival. Uh, at the same time, I think as, as we've changed, as people have passed away and we have new generations, definitely the focus, the knowledge, the um, ability to teach, all of that has, has changed over the years. And so if we look into the future, I hope that we can be a center to bring together the entire community of giving uh, what we can in terms of uh, our culture for uh, the rest of the community, but having everyone involved, I think, would be hopefully the future. Thank you to Reverend Hamasaki for teaching us all about Obon. We hope you had a busy and successful festival. All right, everyone, it's time to chow down on the main course. This past weekend, we had our producer Greg Valoria and executive producer Kenji Tagama attend the San Jose Obon. We're so excited that the biggest Obon festival in the continental United States has finally returned. I attended myself and thought it was a fantastic experience. Wow, thanks for the invite, Ryan. Greg and Kenji talked with Ken Kamei, festival chairperson, Reiko Iwanaga, lead choreographer of San Jose's Bonodori, and a surprise guest from Southern California making her first visit to the San Jose Obon Festival. The San Jose Buddhist Church has celebrated the coming of the ancestors, or Obon, through dance known as Bonodori. But since the last Obon Festival in 2019, the San Jose Obon Festival has been celebrating the heart of Obon online. In 2022, the San Jose Obon Festival is back. And what makes San Jose Obon unique, perhaps, is live musical performances by San Jose Taiko and San Jose Chidori Band, including several collaborations between the two iconic groups like the Shiawase Samba. We spent time at the festivities of the first day with Ken Kame, 2022 festival chair to collect his thoughts on coming back. So coming out of the pandemic, how, what challenges did you have to restart Obon? Uh, the, there were numerous challenges. Uh, mostly um, there was a sentiment to have Obon again, but um, it seems as time went on, there was a, a real um, difficulty getting everyone to um, come back to staff all of the various activities that this, this Obon used to have. Um, some people might have, um, through maybe aging or um, uh, just um, concerns over the environment now, health, in terms of health, the general health too. As you saw here, um, we had a number of dancers, but nowhere near what we had in the past as our um, biggest event, but one of the real concerns I had was, was that um, to make it as uh, comfortable as possible for our guests here. So with Dennis's help, we 
we really tried to, to do that and we increased not only the length of the lines, the dance lines, but the distance. So there's a, uh, spacing. We increased the spacing between the dancers a great deal this year versus uh, 2019. Our executive producer, Kenji Taguman, caught up with longtime lead choreographer Reiko Iwanaga to get her thoughts on this year's Bonodori and legacy to her father in law, Ren Yoshio Iwanaga, who introduced Bonodori to America. Uh, how does it feel to be back on the Yagura? Um, it's nice to see everyone dancing again, and it was a surprise to see as many people as we had again. I thought there might be a lull after our two-year break, but it's nice that everyone's enjoying themselves again. Speaking of Reverend uh, Yoshio Iwanaga, it's been 91 years since he started Bon Orori in America. Um, how does it feel to, keep, to carry on that legacy of your father in law Well, it, it is important, and I, I feel very honored and special to be able to continue it. And my entire family was here dancing today, which was really nice. I made one, uh, I don't know if it's a mistake, but the reason I picked to say Koshin Kyoku was that someone had said it was the 100th anniversary, and it wasn't. <laughs> and that's why I brought that dance in. I thought it was nice to have Reverend Iwanaga's original choreography beyond Obon no Uta. To our pleasant surprise, we bumped into Janice Hirohama, a minister's assistant at the Orange County Buddhist Church who frequents all the Southern California Obon festivals and considers herself an Obon fanatic. Janice shares her feelings about her first trip to the San Jose Obon Festival. My name is Janice Hirohama and I live in Manhattan Beach, California. I'm a member of the Orange County Buddhist Church and uh, I am an Obon fanatic. So I'm really happy to be here at the San Jose Obon for the first time. Uh, San Jose is famous, of course, for the sheer number of dancers and the uh, wonderful setting in the street in historic San Jose, Japantown. So I'm just really thrilled to be here and soaking in the atmosphere and, you know, enjoying the, the history of it all uh, and really happy to be here. Uh, it's a lot of fun. I love the energy. A lot of young folks here. Uh, it's so big. There are like uh, three different Yaguras. Uh, a lot of people dressed wonderfully in yukata. Uh, the, the very special to have the uh, the band, uh, the Chidori uh, band, and uh, the Taiko group, uh, and you know it, it just adds a lot with the live music. You call yourself a Obon fanatic. How many Obon festivals do you go to every year? Uh, in a typical year, pre-pandemic, I would go to a festival every year, every weekend. I would go to a festival every weekend. Uh, we have a lot of them in Southern California at all the different Buddhist temples and also Nisei Week and some community festivals as well. One of the things that is really meaningful about uh, going to Obon festivals is I love dancing the Bon Odori. For me as a Buddhist, it has a lot of significance because you know, we are really supposed to dance in joy and gratitude, remembering our loved ones, our ancestors who came before us. Uh, and so there's a lot of spiritual significance to the Obon festivals and to the dance. Uh, and that's something that means a lot to me. And it means a lot to the 900 plus people who danced the Bonodori to bring it back live in 2022. This is Greg Valoria for Kenji Taguma for the Nichibe Cafe. Thanks to Greg and Kenji for the wonderful video. Now onto our second main course. This coming weekend and next weekend is San Francisco's Obon taking place at the Buddhist Church of San Francisco. They will host one of the few in-person Bon Odori dancing events in Northern California on Sunday, July 24th from 1 to 3.30 p.m. At one of the recent practices, Greg and Kenji talked with Buddhist Church of San Francisco Board President Arlene Kimada and Bon Odori instructors Chiemi and Nobumi Silver as well as former Northern California Cherry Blossom Queen, Kelly Eshima, to tell us more about what to expect from San Francisco's Obon.
Hi, your co-host Kelly here. Our wonderful Nichibei Cafe producers Greg Valoria and Kenji Taguma got to sit down with some members of the Buddhist Church of San Francisco Sangha to learn more about their upcoming Obon Festival, plus their thoughts on the future of Obon and its significance. For two years, we were basically shut down. And it kind of means you get out of practice with a lot of just the normal everyday, how do you put something together? Now we have the element of uh, how do you communicate with folks? Because most people still aren't coming back to church. So you don't have that personal interaction where it's easy to get business done. This festival, uh, we are purposely keeping it small. It's not anywhere near the scale of what we've had in the past with uh, the service one weekend and then the following weekend would be the Ginza Bazaar, which was a huge two-day event. We knew we had to go small this year. So that's the reason that we decided, okay, let's focus on the, the best of Obong, which is really the Odori. You know, that's what people get really excited about. And that's outdoors. So we could do it on Octavia Street and have our Sangha, maybe hopefully feel a little more comfortable about coming out for the first time in two years to celebrate this annual event. I have been helping teach Bono Dodi at BCSF for at least 10 or so years. I think the biggest thing that I've missed is seeing people catching up and just experiencing Bono Dodi together as a community. Uh, we've had virtual Bono Dodi, but it's not the same. And you know, that feeling that you get when you see everyone again, or even people that you weren't expecting to see, connecting, knowing that they're doing well, those are the things that I really enjoy about. I've been involved since I was very, very young, but I've been a teacher for over 10 years. I've been, I guess, technically involved since I was born, um, and I have been teaching for about 10 years. Obon is a big community event, and so I think there's a lot of people that come out specifically for the event because they've been coming since they were a kid or it's something nice to do as a family. And so the last two years, there's a lot of people that you see only at Obon and uh, you get to catch up with and have fun with that you don't get to see during other times of the year. So particularly with the pandemic, I think the human interaction, the human connection has been missing a lot. We're really lucky that we have a number of families who maybe they don't even live in San Francisco anymore, but they support it by participating um, because of their, their families have been doing it for many generations. What should people look forward to? Well, odori, you know, it's the music, it's the the dancing, you know, and if you're wearing the kimono or yukata, the costumes and just the colors. And I think what it is, is just seeing other people, old friends, maybe some new folks that you don't know, but it's the feeling that you're part of a group that appreciates a, a very old tradition, whether it is or isn't your personal heritage, just realizing that it's something that's really been passed through down through the ages. Um, and that's a way of honoring history and your ancestors. The teachers as a group decide every year what dances that we are going to be doing, but this year we really wanted to make it as accessible as possible. All of the dances that we chose would be easy enough to pick up, so it's mostly hand dances. If you can't find your own equipment or you can't get any this year, you don't really need it. There's no pressure at all if you're not a good dancer. It's just a fun experience to come and learn about the temple and experience you know, being together with our temple members and just being to, able to experience it in person again. So the first weekend is July 17th, and that is the weekend that we start off the anchor, the first weekend, with the Obong and Hatsubong service, which is the annual memorial service for folks that have gone before us. And Hatsubong specifically for folks that have passed within this past year. In addition to that, we need food. So we're having our annual Aloha Chicken Barbecue Bento Fundraiser for pickup and for delivery to the folks that live in San Francisco who, you know, have a harder time getting out of their houses. And the third element, which is something that we started during pandemic, is the Family Treasures Silent Auction, which is an online fundraiser event. And I think this year they're going to be concentrating on uh, Japanese, Buddhist, and other sort of um, artifacts, collectibles, things like that. And that's all, all going to be online. The second weekend is the focus on Obong Odori. We are going to start off with what we're calling small bites, which is like an easy-to-eat street food. 1 o'clock to 3.30 will be the odori. 
we'll be honoring three groups of people who have been leaders within our temple. The first is Mrs. Yoshiko Fujimoto, who has been the lead teacher for many, many years. The ultimate, ultimate authority is Fujimoto Sensei. <laughs> If Fujimoto Sensei says, no, it's this way, then it's that way. Second, Reverend Hiroshi Abiko, who is probably the most enthusiastic drummer, dancer, uh, and he also makes taiko. And of course, the third would be any past and present uh, Obon teachers. Those are the folks that, you know, during our practices prior to Obong, they go round and round in the gym, uh, going over the motion so that people feel more comfortable with what the dances are. As long as some of us are willing to put in that work and just provide the opportunity to new people to just see what it's about and see what we're doing, it with providing that opportunity, it, it really um, invites people to come and join. We need to just stay alert and think of new ways of doing things. And I think that's really the key. It's adjust to what the conditions and the interests are of the people that are around you. Keeping our traditions alive, but also passing down and being willing to change and adapt to what's going on in the world, but still maintaining that authenticity and mindfulness of why we participate to begin with. So we are very conscious of the fact that 91 years ago, Reverend Iwanaga started Bon Odori here in the United States at this temple, which is just an amazing thing. Being conscious of that, plus I think the fact that Bon Odori is one of the best things about the Bon season. So it's a lot of fun. And let's make that the, the, the theme for 2022, when for the first time we're coming back live and in person. We hope to see you on July 17th, July 24th, and July 31st at the Buddhist Church of San Francisco. To learn more about San Francisco's Bon Odori, please visit www.buddhistchurchofsanfrancisco.org. Be sure to join everyone at the Buddhist Church of San Francisco on July 17th, July 24th, and July 31st for a three-weekend festival event with dancing on July 24th. I think I'll go by myself. Well, uh, it's time for dessert. If the summer heat is getting you down, then let's check out how to make Amitsu, uh, which is a Japanese dessert with kanten jelly, fruit, mochi, uh, red bean, green tea ice cream, and black sugar syrup. Sounds delicious, Ryan. Shout out to Namiko Ten for the awesome recipe.
Thank you very much, Tanamiko, for that delicious recipe. I cannot wait to try it out for myself. It's my and favorite. And only myself. It's my favorite time of the night, Ryan. Time for the nightcap. This month, we bring back the gochi sour gourmet, Ryan Tatsumoto from Kaneohe, Hawaii, who will be teaching us how to make a cocktail he calls the Hawaii 2.5. Why not Hawaii 5.0? Watch as Ryan fills you in on his naming secret. Hi, it's Ryan Tatsumoto, the Gochi So Gourmet, with another cocktail session where it's always 5 p.m. Today's cocktail I call the Hawaii 2.5. Why not the Hawaii 5.0? Well, I'm pretty sure Hawaii 5.0 has already been trademarked. I call it the 2.5 because it has two products that are based out of Hawaii. One is the Maui wine Lokilani Rose. It's a sparkling wine made on the slopes of uh, Haleakala in Ulupalakua, Maui. And I did check, they do ship to California. So you can get this in your neck of the woods also through mail order. It also contains Kai Lychee vodka and the owner still resides in Hawaii, uh, producing this vodka from yellow rice in Vietnam and infusing it with lychee. And finally, it's garnished with the state flower of Hawaii, the hibiscus. I use this candied hibiscus here, wild hibiscus. However, even if it's the state uh, flower, it's actually not made in this island, it's made in the island farther south down in Australia. So it's just 2.5 instead of 3.0. So we're gonna start out, I'm gonna give you the recipe for just one cocktail. It's probably easier to make it at a party where you can use a whole bottle of the sparkling wine. But for an individual cocktail, what you'll need is one teaspoon of ginger liqueur. I have this Canton, but you can find ginger liqueur uh, generically. Two teaspoons of elderflower liqueur. I have the Saint Germain, you can also find this generic. And three teaspoons of the Kai Daichi vodka. So I'm gonna pour these in my little mixing cup here. If you were to use the, a recipe for the whole bottle, instead of one teaspoon, two teaspoon, and three teaspoon each, it'll be one ounce, two ounce, and three ounce. And you just divide one ounce per uh, champagne flute and you just top it off with four ounces of the sparkling wine. It's because uh, I joined several of these cocktail groups on social media, on Facebook, and somebody once asked, uh, a woman asked, what do you do with leftover champagne? I wanna make a cocktail. So I replied to her, I said, I'm a bit confused. I don't understand what leftover champagne is. Usually no leftover in the Tatsumoto house. So we're gonna pour all of this in a champagne flute. I'm gonna add this candy hibiscus blossom. You can also eat it. it. It basically tastes like a sweet, crunchy vegetable almost. And then top it off with about four ounces of the uh, Lokilani sparkling rosé. So again, this is the Gochi So Gourmet, and this is the Hawaii 2.5. Kampai! The tips for today will list all of the Japanese summer festivals happening this year. But first, we would like to thank everyone for coming to our summer festival, the Soy and Tofu Festival. We hope you all had a great time, whether it was dancing along with the entertainment, eating great tofu samples, or buying an item from one of our vendors. The Soy and Tofu team worked really hard to make the festival happen, and we cannot thank you enough for attending the event. A recap of the festival will soon be up on our YouTube channel, so stay tuned so that you can relive the fun again.
special thanks to our presenting sponsor, the Japan Center Malls East and West, as well as other sponsors such as Japan Airlines, Union Bank, Japantown Community Benefit District, Morinaga, Bachans, and Kikoman. And a special thanks to our many product donors, vendors, entertainers, and volunteers for helping to make the festival a huge success. Now on to the listing of summer festivals. and we'll come back to hang out at the cafe in the coming months. Next month, we will be all about food and Japanese grocery stores. Can't wait to see what we chow down on next. As always, we'd like to give a big thanks to the Henry and Tomoye Takahashi Charitable Foundation for their very generous support of the Nichibei Cafe. We greatly appreciate our collaboration with you in finding new ways to engage our community during this pandemic. In this episode, we focused on summer festivals. We hope you learned a lot about Obon and found some great events to attend this season. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to like, comment, share, and subscribe for more. Thanks, Thanks again, again for joining, joining us at the Nichibei Cafe. Cafe.